I can hear Ian. There's a party here right now. We are live, Len. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining the session. We will be waiting for a few minutes and we'll be getting started. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you try to speak, Mariam? No, I can't, can't hear you. But can you hear me? Okay, let's try to fix that issue. The audio. Okay, anyhow. Um, John, could you, sorry for my background. Um, could you end the video so I can share my slide? Okay, so thank you very much. And sorry for this delayed um, time because of all these technical issues. Um, Mariam, can you hear me okay? And can you try your audio now? No, your audio still doesn't work. Um, all right, but anyway, um, we are here right now because of... Uh, that this is a regular business and human rights um, uh, session uh, at the Tech Up weekend. But today is a little bit different from the other sessions that we've had because um, right now we are under, we will undertake a participatory um, exercise, you know, uh, with in relation to an exploratory research study that we are doing um, in relation to digital rights in Malaysia. So what we will do right now is that um, we will be making this session um, a forum, a forum type session. I will use the Q&A function to, to input you know, the, the information and um, we will discuss from there. So the purpose of, of the research is basically to develop policy recommendations for tech companies and respective government agencies on digital rights and business and human rights. So in Malaysia in particular, the IO Foundation um, is doing a policy advocacy in the context of developing the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights. And we've, we've undertaken this research to gather more inputs and insights to be able to you know, have more solid um, evidence and 
and recommendations to, to those policies, either in-house in the tech companies, so either this is small tech companies or big tech companies or, you know, solo single proprietorship or, or a huge, you know, multinational company. We would like to provide them with some recommendations they could consider in the context of business and human rights and digital rights. Um, another thing is we'd like to gather insights, ideas, and inputs and potential the potential course of actions you know, to improve the digital rights status in Malaysia. And lastly, to determine successes, challenges, and opportunities within the context of digital rights. So these are the purposes of, of the research that we've undertaken. Um, the research targets 20 respondents from government, from the academe, from, from industry practitioners, and from civil society. So right now, we are going to be dealing with information from seven respondents. And the interviews were conducted from July 2021 to September 2021. So actually, um, we initially thought of doing this analysis only internally in the IO Foundation. So, um, but in the course of thinking through and exploring about this initiative, we thought that it might be useful to try it out with a small group of people during the Tech Up weekend. And um, this is where we are right now. Um, we thought it would be beneficial to involve participants, you know, and gather more insights and have more brains basically in thinking through this um, pioneering subject. So for today, um, I will use, like I said earlier, I will use AirMeet's um, Q&A uh, platform. I will post the data there, which came from the interviews, and we will discuss them based on the three, these three, um, themes, challenges, successes, and opportunities. Um, we'll spend about two to three minutes discussing about the, 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 the input, the insight. And um, since it's a little bit challenging to put this into metacards where everyone could, could see, um, we will, this, this session, this initial uh, discussion will only um, uh, focus on discussing each of the insight, the input, the data, and categorizing them to any of these three, but inclusive in the categories, categorization is the discussion about those insights. Okay, so um, we're actually very few in the room. We have only two more people, um, Edwin and um, Adam. So I think we can have, I understand we can have five people in the stage, right? If I'm not mistaken. So, um, sorry, John. Up to eight. Oh, up to eight, sorry. So, yeah, so I think um, so that we could, you know, interact um, uh, effectively, I would just like to invite Edwin and Adam to join the stage. Uh, I think I would need the help of my colleagues to make that happen. All right. Thanks, Adam, for joining. And I think Edwin's coming soon. Okay. So I will start with the first one. And I'll put it as, um, as a Q&A, and I'll show it on stage. So these are one of the insights from our respondents. Evidence-based research and policy work that can help us to implement some of the change that that we're going to see or that we would like to see. This is, of course, in the context of digital rights. So um, do you think this is an opportunity? This is a, a success already, or this is, this is um, a challenge? Uh, do you want me to go first, Lynn? Sure, if you'd like to. Sure. Um, so, my, I was thinking about this since our last uh, conference, and I, you know, a lot of people have ideas about, um, you know, we should have this standard, and we don't really have a standard for privacy, and um, you know, we're, we're over here working on this, we're over here working on that. But um, having been knee deep in GDPR for like years, um, 
I can see that, you know, where we are now and where GDPR alone lets us get to, you know, empowers us. So we have activists in Europe, you know, basically suing, warning or suing companies in order to get them um, to align their privacy and privacy rights. An example being, you know, dark patterns, not not trying to mislead users to, um, to click uh, what the company prefers them to click in terms of privacy rights, but just to give them a fair option. Uh, doing that alone would improve um, globally uh, the privacy rights and awareness of, of people. And then there's so much more that could be achieved within that gap. Uh, so we, we have a lot of uh, scope already and, and powers uh, and a lot of work to do uh, even to improve privacy there. So we don't have to feel like, you know, we should work on these other initiatives, but we don't have to feel like we don't have any room uh, to move. We, we have a lot of work to do and everyone has a lot of work to do. So that's that'll be my response. Okay, thank you. Do you think this is, um, so based on your sharing, you, you were, you're telling me that this is also some kind of an existing practice, right? Yeah, since the GDPR was released and, and soon the, the US um, following suit, the CCPA, mm -hmm you have a lot of powers globally to influence um, companies and even private actors um, mm -hmm. can can influence this. So there, there are weapons, um, to, to use, a word, use that word, um, in order to help protect user rights um, and you know, to, to make them aware they have these rights and then they can act on them. They can contact companies, ask for their data all these sort of things that um, well-meaning people have thought about and managed to get through the EU Parliament, which is no small feat. And uh, for all its imperfections, the GDPR is um, for, for the, you know, in the real world to get that through the EU Parliament and with uh, some of the provisions it has, where it's it's looking forward and saying, look, big tech is just going to ignore any fines. So they've set it to a percentage, which mm -hmm. I, can tell, I can tell you, 4% of <laughs> annual revenue for any company uh, is not something they will ignore, even though people try to say, you know, it, it's it's pocket change. No, they, they would like to keep that 4%. And if it's not going to cost them as much uh, to respect privacy, and in fact, we're, we're now show, can also show the carrot. We can show that um, if you respect privacy and advertise about it, as Apple does, um, you can actually get more customers, about 25%, well, not 25% yet, but about 25% of the population will make an active choice to change their service uh, based on privacy alone. So that's that's a huge uh, plus. And on the on the minus side, you lose some of the, the power that you used to have with targeting and, and knowing people's data. But, but a lot of that activity was was collecting extra data that they didn't have a purpose for. They never found a way to monetize. They were just collecting it for, for no good reason. So it's it's a discipline that can actually help focus a company too if if, if they're you know take the right approach. If they have the, mm -hmm. the white hat approach, we still have dark hat actors. And and again, in terms of the work to do, we we have so many dark hat actors um, that we can focus on and and expose. Uh, yeah, that's. That's a decade worth of work to improve privacy alone before we even get to the grey hat actors, the ones that only really want to tick the box of regulation and do what they've usually been doing. Um, so there's yeah, so much work to do and so much uh, benefit. Um, the, the white hat approach is the um, is the best practice approach. So you know, if, if you want a, a quick answer to what is best practice in data privacy, just think when you're programming something, because we teach at Data Protocol uh, developers, so we think about um, developers and, and how they think. So when you're a developer and you're, you're sitting down, you're making these software products, just think for yourself for a moment, okay, I'm the user now, what actually would I like options would I like for privacy? You know, would I like accept all? Or would I like my usual default choice, which is, um, you know, I don't want to, I want to share as little data with this company as possible in order for, for me to use the service properly. That that should be an option on the screen that they can do with one click. Um, and, you know, as a developer, you just give them that option and, you know, tr just try to present the benefits of giving more data. Say, look, if you give us this extra data, we can do this for you um, and let the chips fall where they, where they may. Um, 
that's uh, yeah, that's uh, the approach of best practices, right? Uh, and then if you do do that, you absolutely have to advertise. You have to tell people that you're doing it. You know, we are best practice of privacy. Our competitors are not doing this. Come and use us instead. And you know, so for some of the benefits you lose by not being dirty and and using people's data sort of surreptitiously. Um, you get the benefit of those almost a quarter of the population that are that are interested in that. Um, so I do see uh, some companies using best practices, but they're not telling anyone about it. You know, and it's like, oh, you yeah, you you're hurting yourself and not giving yourself the benefit. Um, and so we can we can use this carrot and stick to um, to promote best practices. Uh, but like I say, there are black hat actors and gray hat actors, all of which can be encouraged to to up their game. And there's so much work to do there. And all of that work will lead to tangible benefits. Um, you know, every company we move up that scale will, will be a benefit. So that's why I say, yeah, let's keep working on, um, you know, creating a new standard and getting everyone um, involved in data privacy and new initiatives. But we also can uh, be working within the, the existing frameworks, which you know, a lot of work has gone into and shouldn't be under. Mm -hmm. uh, Mariam is asking what White Hat black hat and gray hat are. Adam? Uh, the, what was the question? What is white hat, gray hat, black hat? Yeah, so um, uh, black hat is your, you know, somebody who um, gathers your your personal data. They, they scrape the internet. They get your data without permission. They send you spam emails. They might even be scamming you. Or they just they just want a bunch of emails to try and add to their website. So that's that's not acting in regards to regulations, and it's not acting in terms of uh, best practices uh, at all. So that you know, no moral compass. They're just wanting to make money, or worse, you know, criminal. Uh, gray hat is where you want to do business as usual. You, you've been using data to make profit. Um, you don't want to change, but you realize there are regulations. Uh, you know, there's fines, there's bad press. So what you want to do is the bare minimum of um, meeting those regulations, not getting sued. You have your lawyers come in and tell you, okay, you need to do this, this, and this, but you don't have to do this, this, or this yet. Uh, let's wait for CNIL or one of these regulators to decide on the interpretation of the GDPR before we make this change. So they'll do the least possible, and they'll still try to, to push users to, to click the button that says, give me all your data, um, you know, don't worry about privacy. Uh, you know, you can trust us. Uh, we, you know, we won't lose your data. There won't be a data breach, so on and so forth. And then White Hat is is where we would like most people to go. This is the best practice data privacy, uh, as I was saying before. Um, this is where you actually come with privacy by design, thinking about uh, at the start of your project, okay, how do we maximize the protection of uh, users' rights and their data privacy. Uh, and without, well, with this secondary regard to how we're going to make money, how we're going to grow a user base, all the usual concerns of a service, online service. Uh, the first one is, okay, let's protect the user rights. Uh, and then from there, uh, within that framework, do your business or, or grow your organization. Um, and as I say, if you're going to do that, you absolutely have to have that on your front page saying, you know, we're pri we're a privacy first company. Uh, we're a privacy first organization. Um, yeah, you can you can sign up here and and have your data respected. And uh, there are studies that show that you you get those 20, 21, 22 percent of what I call privacy pioneers. These are people that um, make will make a literal change in their in their decision about services based just on privacy alone. Um, that's the sort of definition I use, and that's why it's only about 22%. But that is growing as people become more aware of data breaches, which is a nice outcome of, of GDPR, that people are you know, pressured to make the announcement within 72 hours that they've had a data breach. That was quite a clever uh, regulations, worked quite well. Um, companies and lawyers are, are choosing to make the announcement rather than try and hide it. Um, because that 72-hour deadline is so tight that there's not a, there's not enough time for the lawyers to sit around for two weeks and say let's let's try and get away with this. They have just announced it because um, you know that 72-hour deadline they need to meet it, um, and so people are aware of data breaches and they're 
more and more conscious that they want to do business with a company that's going to look after their data and, and make it private. Okay. Wow. We spent a lot of time that one insight. <laughs> that's all right. Um, I'm just going to jump to the next one and then encourage um, the other speakers to, you know, answer the, the second input. Um, okay. Let me, I'll do that now. So this is from one of the insights on um, the question, I am my data. So the response is, if all my data are gone, I'm still alive. So. And the three options, Len, can you remind us? Challenge, yeah. opportunity, or? Challenges, opportunities, or successes. So this mindset of, if all my data are gone, I'm still alive anyway. I wouldn't personally know where to categorize it. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't fit exactly into any of the definitions that, that I, I would have on those particular three. It's a relief, but I don't necessarily see it as a challenge or an opportunity or uh, what was the third one, sorry? Uh, success. A success. Is it that a, isn't that a challenge in the sense that um, data-centric digital rights, you know, advocates kind of that the, your data in the internet is you and that anything that's done, you know, if all your data is gone, it's like, you know, harming your arm or leg or part of your body? Well, it, it, it depends. So the, the, way, the way the sentence is established the emphasis is on the fact that the person is still alive. And I can't see that as a problem or a specific win, considering that the data, the fact that data exists is nothing but a consequence of the technology that we have invented ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so if it disappears, the makers or the creators, if you want to see it in a way, do not. So I, I, I don't necessarily see, um, um, how to categorize it in, in any of the uh, any of the three? I, I may just pass the um, the chance, the opportunity to Mariam or to um, um, sorry to Edwin. Edwin, do you have any thoughts? I think he's still reconnecting. I think I don't think Mariam's audio is working. Um, Adam, by by all means, don't don't hesitate to um, to step in. Uh, Edwin's saying, "Can anyone hear me?" No, no, Edwin, we cannot um, hear you, and and your video is is um, what what would you call that? Trying to refresh. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good good point. I think uh, if, if your data's gone, you're you're partly you're injured. Um, you know, uh, you're not dead, but you, you've just had your leg or arm chopped off, <laughs> these, especially these days, and that, that'll just get worse. Hmm. Mariam said she thought when she read it, it was, if I die, I'm still, let me show it on stage. Yeah. She said, if I die, I'm still alive. <laughs> well, an interesting um, thing they're doing now is, is keeping your data alive after you die. So it's a website to honor your loved ones, but also um, an idea I've heard is, is where you want to live forever. And so you, you create an artificial intelligence based on your data in order to, to, to be like a max headroom, if you've ever seen that show. Mm. Only, only people your age and my age remember that show. <laughs> Correct. Hi. All right. Oh, All hi, right. Edwin. You're back. Okay, yes. so Great. Okay, so if I may add, I think to the sentence earlier, I think given the lack of context, but I think still, it still tell uh, is this somewhat indicate uh, a challenge that we are facing? Uh, that is the data literacies of uh, maybe the the user on the US user end. Uh, I think the idea that uh, if all my data are gone, I'm still alive, probably indicates some level of 
uh, negligence or the consequences of data breach or even other sort of data harm. Or we need more contact into how the sentence is said uh, when I can yeah. raise this. Yeah, this was in the question of if 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 the person thinks that the their data, you know, in the principle of I are my data, that you are your data. So um, that representations of you in the internet is you. So the response was, if you know, if all of if all of those data are gone, um, you know that that person would still be alive anyway. So. And, and but that, that 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 has so if you link it on 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 the on principle one from um, DCDR, um, let's see if I can phrase it in my head so I can express it properly. So there is a distinction to be made between authentic data and not authentic data, and. What, what the distinction is as to whether the data that you're considering can be traced back to an actual source entity, in this case, let's say people, or whether that person doesn't exist, or the interaction that is depicted, let's say, for instance, in a, uh, in a deep fake, was not an actual event. So when, when you look at... Um, all your data being removed, the one that is consequential to you would be if the data that is removed is your authentic data. Mm. If it is if it's not authentic, it doesn't really affect you. It, of course, depending on how the non-authentic data may have been used, it may affect you. That's not the story. When, when, when we were discussing about the possibility of removing the digital twin, which is to the context that I believe that this, this comment was, was done, um, digital twins only matter if they are actually authentic digital twins. Mm -hmm. In that case, what you have to, to estimate is what are the repercussions in the digital space where that digital twin was, um, uh, was existing. And... Um, let me make the point that I don't believe that digital twins only exist on the internet. There's plenty of other networks where information is being stored about us uh, and they are just as important as the internet itself or what we understand nowadays as the internet. We'll see where that goes. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would personally want to, to make the, the, the distinction there between authentic and non-authentic that it, it only applies to authentic data. Okay. Anything else, Edwin, Mariam, Adam? No, just that some with the ability now to request companies delete your data. There's some people that would like part of their their data killed off. Uh, you know, particularly if they've they've been to jail or got in trouble and and don't want that left on the uh, the internet. Um. I think from my end side, if there is an opportunity that uh, this present, it will be like, should there be an, some sort of a, an expiry date on the data a company can store? Like, say, the content that I gave now probably can only last for a certain period of time. So after that, they probably need to refresh the content again. Yeah, uh, Mariam has a question, but before we go to that question, I was also thinking, um, what if the, you know, the the deletion of that data was done maliciously? So would any of you know if there's already some form of remedy or some form of way to, not even to recover, but to hold whoever took that? accountable well it very much depends on how the system is designed mm. pretty much so yeah. Big, yeah. You, you you have systems where in order to make a, a, a certain interaction or a certain or, or to, to activate a certain action it requires a cost 
and that cost may be a cost that you will lose that you will lose so it's a it's it's an actual expenditure of whatever it is sometimes it's a, it's a staking so you will be let's say I'm, I'm going to be participating in a specific action and i'm going to be doing something in order to 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 be able to take my turn to do that action i'm going to be staking whatever it is doesn't really matter normally if you look at it from the um the, the current or the most usual scenario nowadays nowadays is to uh to stake for instance cryptocurrencies and so if i want to participate in a specific operation i can say i'm going to be um staking let's say 100 uh, 100 ethers um because i want to produce a specific action and if i misbehave I will lose that. But if my behavior um, is respectful to whichever are the rules of, uh, of engagement of that particular network, that particular um, 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 agreement between parties, um, then the stake is given back to me. Uh, another scenario where these kind of things um, uh, were proposed, I don't believe that they have been properly implemented in, in anywhere. Maybe someone can correct me on, on, on this. But there was a proposal a long time ago, which is, in fact, I believe, uh, from where uh, the, the, the entity of Satoshi Nakamoto took the idea of the, of the um, proof of work for, for the first iteration of, uh, of Bitcoin, which was in order to send an email, it would have to cost you something. Very, very small would cost you something. And so the idea was that if it requires to do a certain uh, amount of operation, and it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't costing you money, it was costing you processing power. You had to do a number of operations in order to be able to send one email, which for one email, that processing power cost was ridiculous. But the idea was that if you were going to be spamming around, sending 100,000 emails a minute, the accumulation of all of that computing power that was required to send each of one of them would be basically uh, um, uh, a counter argument for you to want to do that. Okay, so th there are a number of things that you can do in terms of uh, um, incentivate proper behaviors, uh, and you could implement those in the system. It very much depends on what is the agreement between the parties to, to how you're going to be interacting. So, for instance, um, can I have access to certain data and then misuse it or not? Then maybe one of the solutions is to stake. And so I, I'm proposing that I'm going to be, uh, um, I'm, I'm assuming or, or, I'm, or I'm ensuring to you that I'm, going to, I'm not going to be misusing this data and, and, and I'm going to be using it only for, let's say, medical research. And if it is, and what I what I have to do is stake one million dollar. I'm I'm really inventing a case a case scenario here. Okay, um, if given the the situation, it is proven that it wasn't the case, then I'm lose, I'm losing the million. And in that case, there is a loss that you can quantify. You're probably going to be thinking twice because you know one time one million. Maybe you have the budget to do that. A hundred times that starts being a little bit more stingy. Okay. Um, John, what was it? Uh, how would you determine if a data was authentic? This question, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that also has a somehow difficult, so difficult. No, it's it's not a straightforward uh, answer, but it, it it it's understandable. Let's say that someone is playing a violin on the street and you are listening to that to that composition and you get a microphone and you start recording that how authentic is that recording versus the original hmm. it very much depends on your or your level of tolerance of that music pretty much what it is and so there was always been this very huge fight or fight or you know preference war between uh, vinyl and CDs because the guys from the vinyl would say only vinyl has the, the, the fidelity of the actual recording from the studio versus the CD because of the sampling method. Uh, you know, it loses in certain qualities of the, in the sound, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
when you are measuring about whether something is authentic or not, you're basically looking into how, how accurately it represents what it is supposed to be representing. And to the very least, whatever it is measured, whether it's actually accurate or not. An example, for instance, if you're taking about a digital twin, would a digital twin that represents someone with data on their heart based on some IoT device on the peacemaker, for instance, that doesn't have data from their liver, would it actually be a proper digital twin, an authentic digital twin? Yes, it's just incomplete. Mm -hmm. But the data that is there is actually authentic because it does represent. If the data would be manipulated or generated randomly, then it wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. So it really has to do with the, with the case scenario and how complete the digital twin needs to be for your particular use case. And, and when you start looking into use cases, you also want to look into data minimization in order to avoid providing more data than necessary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I would say there's a degree of fidelity and there's mm -hmm. a degree of, of, uh, uh, of the use case of the need for that particular representation for that particular digital tool. Okay. And, and, and I don't believe, Maria, that there is at the moment a scale to do that. Mm -hmm. So let me put it this way. Because th this is something that I've been asking around in, in certain circles in, in the past weeks. No one has been, has been able to, to give me a, a, an answer. And, and, and I, it, it just occurs to me that it, it could actually be related. So I'm going to assume for a moment that everyone has heard about um, um, the Turing test. I'm just going to see people know. Um, so I see Adam, Mariam, Turing test. Have you heard about it? Just no or not? No? Edwin? No? Okay, so let me explain very quickly. Um, the Turing test is named upon um, um, Turing, the mathematician, the guy who invented um, the first. So Christopher, if you watched, uh, if you have watched the, the, the movie. Uh, um, and so the Turing test is a test that you pass by interacting via text with an other endpoint. So you'll be sitting in a computer and you are interacting with a, with, with, a, with a piece of software and you do not know if at the other end of that piece of software there's a human or there's a machine trying to interact with you. It is said that if it is a machine, it passes the Turing test if you cannot make the difference between, a, between the machine and a potential human. If the machine tricks you to the point of thinking, oh, I'm definitely speaking with a human, then that machine has, has reached a degree of complexity because natural language has a degree of complexity that for us is typically sort of, uh, um, um, and we don't think about it consciously, but if, if I had to, to speak with them, I mean, you, you, all of us have been speaking with bots on websites and so forth, and we can see how sometimes the answers don't make any sense and the flow of the conversation is disconnected and the language is not properly used. It's very subtle things, but we, we can actually figure out this is not a person on the, other, on, the, on the other hand. So if you make it so that you can simulate as much as possible that interaction to the point where, it, where, it, where, it, uh, where it, uh, it, it makes you, it confuses you and you believe it's a human, that's passing the Turing test, okay? And there's been machines that have been able to do that. Now, let's imagine for a minute what Adam was mentioning before as to having a machine or system that spins a process that will start behaving as if it was you based on the information that has been collected about you. And I'm talking about not only behavior, but also knowledge. Uh, um, um, emotional uh, triggers uh, to the point where if it had to simulate, if you had to see how things I type on the screen, that I would type it exactly at the same type of typing methodology that I would have with my own um, fingers. 
So the way I type in my keyboard is different than the one that Adam does, that Mariam does, that Len does, or that Edwin does. In fact, if you are trained into it, and you, you could actually look patterns, and you could basically recognize not who it is, but you could you could associate five patterns and put them in, into categories, as knowing that this is person A, this is person B, this is person A again. All right? So imagine that you have, we, we have this Turing test for uh, simulation of conversation, but we don't seem to have a, a test, or at least not name, or at least not that I know of, for simulation of behavior. And so that goes back to what I was mentioning that, that, that about the thing about the, the authenticity of data. If, if I'm trying to imitate someone else specifically based on that behavior, I would say that the, there's a degree of, of measuring authenticity based on whether they can fool you or not in their um, uh, impersonation. And I don't think that there's any impersonation test uh, um, um, I never heard about it. I'm not saying there isn't. I've just never heard about it. And I would I suspect that if the, if it had been already um, pushed around, it would have come somewhere in the in the news. Adam, have you heard about any, any of it? Uh, I was thinking about the the Turing test and how it might be a bit old school. So for for younger people, uh, deep fakes is a is a sort of updated example. Like how deep deep fakes can now do a live video of Elvis Presley uh, with his voice. You know he can respond to your questions like a person. How how you know at, at a certain point you can't tell whether it's Elvis or not, except that Elvis might be dead. Um, so uh, yeah, they're working on software to try and detect deep fakes. But of course, this is the the problem with security as well. Every time you you improve your detection of fakes, the people making the fakes improve that process. So it's it, it's ongoing. Um, the the only thing to remember is the basic premise of um, like computing and security and hacking is you know it's impossible to completely secure uh, a system. It's impossible to write a system without any bugs. So you should also anticipate that it's impossible to know for sure if something is fake or not. And it's impossible for the reverse as well. Um, so if you keep that in mind, you're you yeah you know, you're less likely to get completely fooled by these things. Think think about the fact that nowadays, I believe it was about a couple of years ago that Logitech, the manufacturer of um, um, uh, of mouses and keyboards. Uh, was caught in one of the drivers. If my memory is not betraying me, it was specifically for mouse drivers um, that was sending the usage behavior, the pattern, the, the behavioral patterns of, of, of the users to, to the servers. So essentially how much you would move your hand and whether you would do the click and how long would be the click, how many times you do a double click, what's the, what's the difference between the two clicks? That's also gonna be specific of, uh, of my habits so Edwin will have a different way of doing double click that than, than I do. And so if you capture all of that data, you can essentially start replicating and, and, and following what Adam was mentioning. You know, this thing about, I have a way of, uh, of measuring, but then uh, uh, the ones who are trying to, to, to break the system, find better ways to, to simulate and then have, it's all about sampling rate. So, um, the more you sample, the more points you have of comparison, but you can always increase that so that I make it similar to the real. So let, let me put it let me put it this way. I don't know the 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 the, the story of fingerprints in crime. I'm just going to be inventing a little bit in here. Um, let's say for instance that at the very beginning of discovering fingerprints and using them for, um, for forensics and for investigation, maybe they were only looking for 10 points of reference in the fingerprint. And so whoever wanted to fake a fingerprint only needed to make 10 points equal to the origin. But then the forensics decided, oh, actually I can increase the, sample, the sampling and go to for 50, for 50 points. 
But then those who wanted to commit crimes decided, oh, let's just find a way to actually simulate 50. And they got to that. And it took some time for them for the researchers to realize that they had caught up into the so you, you see what I mean? You can always try to 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 go one step further. And it very much is you can only you get to determine if something is veridic for you or not, if you have enough sampling rate and you are satisfied with how much you have been sampling it. And you can always rig that. Because measurements, the moment that you establish a scale, you have already established how you're going to be uh, uh, cheating on the scale. That's another conversation, but yeah. I hope um, that's probably something for Mariam. Mariam, can you confirm? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so I'd like to proceed. I'm, I'm just checking the time. We have about 30, 40, 30 to 45 minutes. I mean, 30 minutes if we stick on the time and if we kind of catch up on the 15 minute delay, then 45 minutes left for the discussion. I've posted three questions. I'm going to show one, I mean, not questions, insights. I'm going to show one now. So one insight is we might need to think of maybe there ought to be an audit committee to look into whether platform algorithm is discriminating against any group of peoples or whether there ought to be a more transparent approach. So I think since it's kind of a recommendation, it has not yet been done, right? Or would there be some examples in the US or would probably, would any of you know if there are examples in other countries that this, this you know, system, some kind of an audit committee um, to look at discrimination? You know? And I think by discrimination, this doesn't only mean, um, uh, you know, religion, race, or however, but it probably also includes access, um, connectivity. Anybody? Uh, shall I go first? Uh, sure. Um, so uh, what I've noticed with this is the media and um, researchers being from universities uh, doing this work by hand uh, using automated tools sometimes, for instance, to detect uh, uh, platforms, you know, see what platforms are doing in terms of advertising, who they're targeting and particularly around politics, things like that. So they, they tend to gravitate towards sensitive issues, you know, like race, religion, um, but it's, it's probably important to, to also check for other biases as well. But I, I don't know of, a, of an automated system that, that sort of bubbles up and reports, um, hey, there's this new bias going on in the internet um, that's excluding this group or um, making this group look bad. And I think um, the other area is that fake news, um, you know, what that's being used to influence people and which groups that's a form of bias as well like okay we know this group of people will be influenced by this fake news so we're going to produce the fake news and deliver it straight to them mm -hmm. um that's a very biased approach um which is probably breaking some rules mm -hmm. and those things can be automated Adam. Yes, well, they, they, they have to be to be effective. Like, you can't do that by hand. Um, uh, uh, maybe a decade or so ago, we used to hire a lot of cheap labour in a, in a country that didn't have a good exchange rate. We could <laughs> afford to have hundreds of people do something. Uh, but now, the scale of these things, you, you, you're better off using computers to do it. I think in Southeast Asia, we still have those, like, troll farms, you know. <laughs> People who do targeted attacks, like really manually people, not, not automated. Yes, um, and it, even more benign things like uh, factories full of people uh, farming uh, digital currency and games and things like that is just amazing. Uh, what, whatever there is, uh, you know, humans or computers will be used to, to fill in all those gaps. So we should, should expect that. Mm -hmm.
John, would you have some thoughts? I have a number of them, but I'm not sure I want to share them right now. Uh, actually, Edwin um, sent a message over chat. Would you like to? Hey, yeah. so um, it, it's probably not the best example, but I think uh, the recent the recent draft law uh, algorithmic draft law uh, published by the Cyberspace Administration of China has sort of like opened the conversations about regulating uh, algorithms. Uh, I think in this case they are looking at uh, specifically at the platform, uh, sorry, the algorithms, algorithmic recommendation features. Um, mm -hmm. There are lots to in, inside this draft, which I don't think the time will allow me to cover them. But I think I, I, sh I left the link there for you, for you guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. China's always doing many things in the field. <laughs> Sorry for that comment. Um, mm. <laughs> just can't help it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. China and Russia both. Yeah. Right, yeah. Mariam. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but I think the, the discrimination is also, I mean, the popular discrimination will be race, religion, but there are also other, you yeah. know, discrimination that's happening beyond those usual things that we meet, you know, mm. on the road in the, fight for social justice and all of that I mean, sometimes you miss out the tiny details of you know just just um location for instance simply because you're born in in a rural area or urban area and you know which areas have had developments first in terms of um telecommunications um, towers and all that you know that might not be targeted but the your location has been a consequence to your lack of access and therefore probably lack of um, reach to relevant and reliable information that you would, would need for your for your community. So, um, yeah, but I think that that's, I mean, out of this context, actually, because we're, we're talking about um, algorithms and how it could be. Yeah. yeah. In terms of data privacy law, um, if it's targeting an EU citizen, we can almost always say it's going to be violating GDPR because there's very few citizens who, for that use of the data, they, they had given permission for. Like, you've got to tell them, I want to use your data to target you and send you fake news. They're not going to say yes to that. Yeah, yeah, right. Len, may I um, share here oh, something? Sure, sure. So I was finally able to put into my head what, you know, what I was saying before that I didn't want to share was because it was still having, it was still running in my head how, what I wanted and how to, how I wanted to, to articulate it. So I think what, what bothers me about the audit committees is that we have a tendency, we have a tendency to be absolutists about them. As in, the people who are going to be in the audit in that committee are also just as failable as the ones who may have or may or may have not made the mistake in the, in the first place in the data set that has been provided to the system that all of a sudden has been detected with a specific bias. Or, I mean, it's not even, so the fact that we define something as bias traditionally bothers me as well because a bias is a very subtle definition that only certain people may understand as such. And, in, and if you think about it, a, social, a societal decision, it's a bias embraced by a majority. So, you know, when we're talking about, about biases, I'm, I'm always very on my, on my tiptoes about what is exactly that we're talking about here. Because you can't, you cannot tell me that you want to defend, for instance, a specific minority against a specific so-called bias when specifically democracies work based on majorities I, I i cannot i cannot mix those two concepts i don't know how to reconciliate them as in we, we vote for a specific president and it's is the majority and if i don't like it it's just too bad for me because i have to accept that the majority decided to do so 
can I can I say that, 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 that there's a bias in the system against me because I didn't vote? No, it's just the system as it is. And so I'm always very worried about what is it that we understand as algorithmic transparency, algorithmic bias systems, et cetera, et cetera, because I'm not 100% sure that we understand what's the nature of the concept itself. And a lot of times I think that we confuse bad intention with sheer stupidity. You know, you may have, you may have intentionally modified a data set in order to obtain an objective that you wanted. And sometimes you just didn't know better. And, and, and there should be space for a certain degree of forgiveness when so when people just mess up, mm. just, just if the fact that if, if I mess up, no one is going to be forgiving me. What makes me as a reaction is I'm not going to tell anybody if I miss up. Mm -hmm. And so, the, so the, there's, there's an element there of, uh, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by how these, these narratives are being used lately and how they are mixed into technology without necessarily, understa without necessarily understanding how the technology functions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we need to kind of dig a little bit more on, you know, discrimination based. I would say the need is, is, to, is to define way better in a much more robust way, the language. Mm -hmm. So that we know exactly what is it that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think it's a problem of language and definitions and, and too many people are taking definitions to do many different ways. And accepting the fact that whatever we define today with X tomorrow can be defined as X prime, and then the day, the day after X double prime because you know it serves a specific uh, intention, and that's what makes it difficult to navigate these kind of conversations. And the, if, if it's difficult for us to navigate them from a language perspective, imagine from a technical perspective. Hmm. They don't even know where to start, and we are not providing them with the proper guidance at that point. Mm -hmm. So one one of our members, uh, Paul from Kilt uh, Kilt Protocol, they have an approach uh, using blockchain and and authentication by the crowd. So you you become a, an actor who can authenticate something, and if enough people out there authenticate it, which is a bit like how uh, Bitcoin works, um, then that's considered valid and authentic data. So um, that's another way to go where you get the, the crowd uh, to do the heavy lifting for you in terms of, of finding something authentic. The, the downsides will be, you know, you get your false positives where um, the crowd actually says something's authentic when it's not. Um, and also you have the, the bias of the crowd. You know, when you involve humans, they it's like the pitchfork, the group with pitchfork. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, very, uh, innovative uh, approach to um, authenticating things and, and putting on the blockchain so you, you know you have a history at least of, of what was authenticated and when and why uh, so you can look through that trail and, and trust that it hasn't been edited after the fact. Mm -hmm. I was also thinking um, I mean in the in the matter of definition and you know nailing down what what we could say you know discrimination in that that happens based on the power of technology um because it, the other side of the coin actually is that um since when i mean for as long as you have access you there's probably you know you there's probably a technology you know operates in a way that it wanted to reach as much as possible so you could think about it that it actually kind of provides you uh, an equality space because it welcomes you know anyone from where, wherever walks of life. I mean, for as long as access. I mean, there's a there's a prerequisite of connectivity and and um, uh, equipment there you know that you're able to access you have connectivity that you have the right equipment of course or some form of equipment to get connected but um all these uh biases or all of these 
um, traditional, uh, you know, labels to discrimination, you know, based on color, based on race, based on religion, I don't know, based on whatever group of people. These are, these, the internet or the, the digital space actually kind of provides you an opportunity to equalize that one way or another. Um, if, if, if you think about it in that other side of, of, of the opportunity. So maybe it is also an answer to end you know, discrimination. I mean, while not defining it in total. <laughs> Edwin, or yeah, definitely not Mariam because she doesn't have any audio. Do you have any thoughts before I go to the next um, insight? None. Okay. Um, this one. So these topics, digital rights that we are talking about, have been discussed both on the management as well as the board level on how the company protects and respects the human rights of our customers. So this is a case um, scenario. So it's a kind of a proof, you know, that there's a company in Malaysia that actually discussed in the board level, you know, how their company can protect and respect the human rights of their customers. So, I mean, I would definitely right away consider that both a success and an opportunity. And it's a model that um, we could, you know, highlight and also propagate. So that could be a reference to other companies or even other companies in other countries, um, tech companies in particular. Any other thoughts other than that? Well, um, th this is an interesting one um, that I talk about with Data Protocol, uh, where we teach developers data privacy. And the reason we actually went ahead and did that was that, um, you know, here you're talking about digital rights uh, coming at the management level, the board level, but, you know, it gets very diluted by the time it gets to the developer or the website builder. Um, the person who's actually, you know, if you think about a builder making a house, the person actually putting the bricks down and the mortar, uh, the, you know, the person that should be telling them how to do that, how to put the mortar on is like seven levels above them. And so that person says something, that person says something. And by the time it gets down to the brick layer, uh, he or she is putting them you know, sideways, the mortar doesn't stick, uh, all sorts of problems. Um, and so that's why in, in this particular example for us, Data Protocol, we said, let's teach the developer how to um, implement privacy directly and, and you know, instill in them some, some pride or responsibility to do that uh, and, and motivate them to do that. Um, so same here. You know, we should also look at the digital rights um, have being discussed with the people that, that are actually implementing uh, it directly, like uh, doing the actual work, make sure they're, um, they don't actually need the management to tell them the right thing to do, just make it part of their, their rights, their um, responsibilities as, as a citizen. Um, you know, you just, you know, just like you don't go around murdering people, you also don't go around go around violating digital rights uh, we're not there yet mm -hmm. um i just wanted to share that actually that's a very in interesting input adam because one of the respondents actually also shared that um um you know like what you said you know sometimes decisions before before they actually could i mean in a huge company before they could finalize anything even if they have this um personal commitment to digital rights and they apply that sometimes it i mean the other way around it also goes to many different gatekeepers like five seven gatekeepers and which have different interests and yeah so it has probably to match you know the programmers have that commitment to digital rights and a board like this one this company having that commitment to digital rights that they would kind of have the same wavelength 
but um, in the cases where the interests and the commitments are different, um, there's one that the board, you know, kind of bulldoze the staff to follow whatever they, they want. Um, and the other hand, when it's a staff, you know, trying to push something to the board level, and the board, there's just different gates that, you know, they can't seem to cross or enter. Yes, we yeah. before we designed our software, we did a study on US developers, 600 of them. We asked, uh, do they feel pressured by the board and by their management to, to ship code that doesn't re respect digital rights of, of people? And 83% and said yes. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so there's definitely, what you said is definitely true. But also the problem that I just said, you know, that the board is, is thinking at this top level, uh, they do some data privacy, d digital rights training, data privacy training, you know, that their information doesn't get, that information doesn't get down to the person doing the work very well. Uh, so it also works uh, for us in reverse. The person doing the work, if they're doing it, um, you know, properly and building the house properly, um, the board isn't looking at every single detail of what this person down here is doing. So they can't police everything they're doing. So they can just be respecting pri uh, privacy rights all over the place. Uh, and the board might pick up on two or three things, but they won't pick up on all of them. And so by default, the house is going to be built properly. Then the board might come in and say, I, I don't want a window, any windows in this house. Okay. So when it's not a perfect house, but it, it's much better than, than the other way around where they, they don't bother to build the house uh, properly in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. I'll put a link to the report in the in the in the chat, but the it's chat. also in the data protocol uh, booth. Mm -hmm. um, Edwin, do you have any thoughts on this um, potential uh, yeah, success sure. story? Uh, not really success stories, but I think it is. Uh, I think for my end, I think I just have questions for how a question slash concern. Uh, for state-run corporations, so over here. For, I am sorry for what? For state-run corporation. State-run corporation. Okay. So I'm talking about something like a, almost like a regulator come, business model kind of state-run corporation. So mm -hmm. in at least in in my in Malaysia, I think, uh, the government has uh, already set up a digital national Berha that is in charge of all the. 5G uh, services and uh, regulation of 5G services, if I'm not mistaken, they are, they are also handling that too. And mm -hmm. sooner or later, the government is also considering a, 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 a national level super app that covers every all sort of service ranging from paying your bill, paying your utility bills to paying all your summer tickets and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought like, as much while I agree that maybe there will be some sort of a high level digital right principles that we they will follow, but I think for those whether or not are they at the board level or are they at the uh, at the say the worker level, uh, there will be a con it will be there might be a slippery slope where they will where they will use uh it it will be tempting to use the data for other purposes. Uh, since they are both regulator and slash a business player in the in the market, but yeah. So that's already existing now. Uh, the digital nationals company that in charge of five G services, yes, mm -hmm. uh, they are. If I'm not mistaken, they are in the midst of setting up a a, a national level super app. Yeah. Super Though app. I, I'm, yeah, I'm not a fan of the term super app or the concept either, but yeah. <laughs> if it's more than that, it's now the super duper app. <laughs> I, I'm not sure, but... <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Yes, but it doesn't sit well with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, especially if it's government-owned, it feels like... Mm -hmm. Yeah, or maybe if it's government owned, there, there should be like a third party board, you know, composed of civil society, mm -hmm. businesses, you know, to. Yeah. John, you want to say anything? Yeah, I mean, we keep having this, this, these conversations or this, this, this arguments going on about what happens with the data uh, and so forth, because the, the, the issue keeps being to me 
in, in our interpretation of the nature of data. Mm. If we keep looking at seeing data as detached from us, as not us, then it's something that you can trade with and you, and you are thinking about, you know, who's going to have access to it and what's going to be the, the misuse, et cetera, et cetera. But think about it from, from, from this perspective. As a person, when I enter an engagement with a government or an engagement with a company, I basically have a contract. You know, and, and the amount of engagement that can happen between me and a company is reflected by the contract, and that's it. And if another company wants to interact with me, another contract has to be signed. And by being born, uh, the government has a contract with me in the shape of, assuming a democratic uh, system, of course, in the shape of a constitution. And that's the, the most that, that the government can, can, can do with me. It, it defines what, I, what is the, duty, the, the amount of duties of care that the government has to do, but also my responsibility as a citizen towards that same institution. And so when you start looking at data from the extent from an extension of that particular person, then you start grinding your, 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 your teeth about all of this possible mismanipulation and sharing of data between different entities with whom you may not have entered into an agreement prior. Mm. It's easier to, 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 to generate an emotion uh, about it because it's something much more relatable. For as long as we feel that data is just this magic dust that is floating around, it's going to be very, very difficult to create those uh, those narratives and those those understandings. You're not going to have people getting behind defending data. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to jump into the last question, and I think, yeah, we could take that as the last questions before we wrap things up. I just don't want to extend everyone beyond our time we've allocated um yeah so there are so many people in urban slums that are digitally illiterate there's a lot of inaccurate information that led to a lot of unfortunate outcomes so definitely a challenge i think this goes to the philosophy of, uh, in general, education um, is, Noam Chomsky said, if, if you want to go back to some, the, the one thing you can do that will help fix all problems, it's education. Um, but the other problem we've seen with this is, uh, like in the American example, we have some people that don't want to become uh, literate, <laughs> you know, they, they want to become, they stay Luddites. Um, and so they're resistant to, it's not a, just a matter of reaching them, but convincing them that this is a, a good thing. Edwin? I think we'll just point out the challenge that uh, I notice is happening around, uh, especially during the pandemic. So. I am. I, I think I caught a number of like, uh, say, anti-vax comic groups that is, uh, that somehow they becomes the main news and information portal for some of the, uh, people, uh, in my hometown, which is, relatively small town, or or you can almost like suburban, yeah, so, the there is uh, a lot of need I, th I think the one interesting that i actually noticed is that these people engage with uh a lot of these inaccurate informations where whether is it about the vaccines or about the 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 covid 19 virus uh flu uh i think one driving force is that this to some extent they have they do not trust the hormonist portal. I'm not sure where they, where they develop that sense of uh, skepticisms uh, towards uh, the traditional media. But yeah, I, I suppose this would be quite a big challenge moving forward. And that um, digital illiteracy plays into that. You know, you, people get emails that they don't understand how emails work and they think it's official just because it's got some signature on it. And so they believe it. 
or they take action uh, and send all their money somewhere. Um, so yeah, if they were a little more digitally literate, uh, they would be more um, more uh, resistant to being uh, misinformed. Uh, but this is a, not just a digital problem. This is a human problem that we haven't solved for thousands of years. Len, you're muted. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, what I wanted to say was that, um, you know, there's this really a huge gap, of course, from those who know how to use the technology, from those who have the equipment to use the technology. Um, and many things that are happening already in the world, not only in Southeast Asia, I mean, it's everywhere, is that we're really shifting more and more into digital and the transition, you know, the training, the adaptation, you know, what you need to know um, to navigate that new space. It's taking a lot of your social political life, social economic political life. You know, it, most of that is already happening there. You need to cope, you know, if, especially if you're in a democracy, you need to be able to know how to, you know, to navigate, to be able to exercise your, your rights as well. But since it's, it's happening in a, you know, in a pace that, that's fast, that, I mean, even those who are literate, have a hard time coping, but more for those who are, you know, not educated to use the technology, what more for those who have no access to the technology? Um, yeah, there will, there will, people will be left behind and same as when we are in the analog world where people are affected because of poverty, there are also, you know, people that are digitally poor. Um, yeah, so, it's, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge um, mountain that we need to cross over, climb, destroy. <laughs> I don't know to to move in a digital world where everyone is given their own equal space to be able to vote. You know, like what John said earlier, it's the majority voting. But if the majority that's voting are only those who have access to vote, the decision is also. Um, you know, not only it, it's not fully fair if, if you use a much fairer word. Yeah. And yeah, anyway, I don't want to speak. I mean, there's a lot of things in my head right now <laughs> because of uh, because of these and also because of elections, for instance, a lot. I mean, I really feel that our social, political, economic life it's not before we use the internet is only for fun communicating with friends you know it's not not our life but now it's most of our lives are already there and that has a lot of there, there needs to be a way to for us to be educated on how to navigate that and to protect ourselves as well and so this is not only a problem for people i mean definitely it's more of a problem for people that are digitally illiterate and people are poor but it is also generally a problem to many, many of us. Yeah, um, I'd like to ask each one of you to give like a closing statement um, before we close the discussion. Maybe we should start with uh, Edwin, if you don't, if you don't mind. Uh, I think I sort of wrote that down. So, uh, I guess I would just repeat that. Uh, I think the lack of digital and data literacy, it's a societal problem that requires uh, a multi-pronged approach or even you can say it's also a multi-dimensional uh, which i will work uh so education it's one of the solution it's probably the one of the is one of the very first step we need to take but it's definitely not the only one uh, i i really like today's discussions uh, especially the idea of having a data protocol and also uh the concepts of authentic uh and in texting data i thought that's very uh, thought insightful Thanks. Thank you. Adam? Yes, thank you for the discussion. I think uh, let's remember there's a lot of positives um, and not, not get too pessimistic looking at you know, the young people here that are passionate about this subject and, and working on it is, is a good sign. Um, so 
yes, keep up the the good work and 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 keep aware. And I think our two our two tools are um, knowledge, so education and motivation. Um, be realistic about how humans are motivated. You know, the soft skills, the soft sciences, um, the social sciences. You know, um, you can think this is the best way for humans to act that they are not going to act that way just because you say that's the best way they're going to act. You, whatever you put in place, uh, which is why I said the GDPR was clever, the, cleverer than previous um, regulations, whatever you put in place has to anticipate, okay, how are human beings going to try to avoid this? Are they going to be motivated by it? Um, you know, and, and some of, the, some of the, the, the clever ideas in the last decades or so have been things like um, uh, paying people to, to pollute less. Right, so you, you you look at their profit motive, and you make it more profitable for them to pollute less uh, than to pollute more, um, and that's a that's a similar idea that I'm hoping we get to with data privacy. It's it's going to be more profitable to respect people's privacy. You're going to get more customers uh, than than if you don't. So fingers crossed. <laughs> um, John, I think Marianne will just have to write hers. Um. The more we have these conversations, I would say that, that I'm, I'm still trying to, to piece together um, a number of elements. And when you were discussing about the, the sense of responsibility, uh, not only from people who might be um, literate, but also those who are literate and how they use these technologies and so forth, um, I would like to have access to what was the first reports or the first analysis or the first research as to why it became mandatory to, to get a driver's license. From a time where cars could be driven by anybody to all of a sudden decide that it was a mechanism that could be dangerous into a number of, of dimensions, into, an, in, into a high scale into those, those dimensions. And so I, 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 I'm, I'm having some somehow the suspicion that we might get there at some point and that, it, that there may be an argument to, to be made that before having access to certain technologies, you're going to have to be getting your license to, um, um, to do so. In, in a way, in a way that actually, actually happens in many, many more things in a transparent way that we think, such as, for instance, the ability to vote. So it is understood that until you are uh, of age, you don't have the knowledge and the capacity to evaluate your political decisions and therefore you shouldn't, you shouldn't get close to it to an urn. So I wonder if at some point we're going to be deciding that we have reached a point where the dangers of using the te specific technologies are going to be, you know, the skills are going to be too tilt and that maybe you need to prove your, your worth and your knowledge and your, um, your ability on those to avoid your harms and all the harms because that's, that's, that's the idea of getting a license. You basically avoid your harm and, and that of the others. I'm not sure how that's how is that going to play out. It's just an idea that is just running around my head. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Um, this is a first try to discuss, you know, insights from interviews into this kind of forum. Um, it's actually a new approach into data analysis. I mean, you you unearth a lot more, you know, discussion and insights by talking certain points. Um, um, we've I prepared. 30 plus um, inputs, and I think we've covered less than 10, <laughs> but that's all right. Um, this is an initial approach, and this is really more of a, um, you know, more of a, uh, a test run, you know, how it could work. I mean, this would be wonderful to do in person where people sit together with meta cards, but as we are in a pandemic, it's, it's really, really challenging to do that. So thank you, and I hope to, to see you um, in the next Tech Up. Uh, we'll, we'll continue our interviews and we will continue to kind of capture many of these insights and, and talk about it more in the future. So thank you, Edwin. Thank you, Adam. And have a great um, Saturday, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for hosting, Lynn. <clears throat> Thanks, Jane. <laughs>